I have too much hair. That's why I'm wearing a hat because I I needed like a haircut about two months ago, and then you stopped being able to get a haircut. So this is a time when you're you're fortunate. <laughs> Me and the rest of the other. Uh... Yeah, like I've got like it's just I'm, I'm trying yeah. to like. It's great. I, I re- have that problem. I used to have like, a afro as a, as a kid. You know, I used to yeah. have a lot of hair, and then it, I swear to God, it was like as soon as I was like. I'm going to be a cartoonist. As soon as I decided I was going to take it seriously, like it's my hair trickled off my head and got into my glasses. And I was like, oh, what? That's weird. What is he started to hunch over and <laughs> like, just, is that yeah. your studio that you're in? Yeah, this is my little studio room. So you can see I've got some, yeah. got my Dan Klaus poster, some artwork. I got Tony Millionaire, Julie Doucet, and John Vio Castre over there. Oh, nice. Yeah, my my little desk here. Do you live in, in Chicago still? Yeah, I am in Albany Park. Hmm. So that's pretty close by, isn't it? It's it's actually it's just a neighborhood in. in <laughs> I have no city. idea. I just, <laughs> <think you're> just, <laughs> Chicago people are like, "What are you?" Okay. Albany Park is in the city. Like I am in the city. Like I am in Chicago. I'm not. Not one so, of those posers. I I always feel bad for people who are like, uh, like, hey, where do you live? I live in New York. And you go, oh, cool, Manhattan. They're like, no, uh, Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> like New York State. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, how many kids do you have now, Jeffrey? I haven't talked to you in a long time. Two. Yeah, so Oscar is the older, my older son. He is, um, he'll be 14 later this year, which is insane. That's in, really insane. In, wow. I'm in a seven as a newborn babe. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so as a cartoonist, when you found out that you were going to be a father, did that just totally freak you out? Like, uh, I better figure out how I'm going to do this? Were you thinking I need to get a better job? What happens? Uh, no. No, I always had supreme confidence in my abilities. Um. No, I mean, I still had a, I still had my day job that was paying the bills at the time, um, and my wife actually, like, at that point, um, was making way better money than me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the financial side of it was never the the big worry. It was more like, oh my gosh, like, how do you take care of another living being? Yeah, that will get bigger than a cat. So yeah. at some point. Were you working at Barnes and Noble at the time? Yeah. Yeah. So and and then, you know, my the comic stuff was was always a supplement to that. And um it wasn't too long after we had Oscar that that like the comic stuff was going well enough that I ended up quitting Barnes and Noble. So right before your job became obsolete. Because you were weren't you like in the C D section? I was in the music department, which they still like have the music department, but it it's like it's like such a looks like such a struggle because I think now they're like selling vinyl. But yeah, when I started, I mean, we had it was CDs and VHS tapes. Oh my god! When I started, and then like and then there started to be DVDs, and eventually like the DVDs took over the VHS. Yeah. To me, I always saw it as as culturally in terms of like art culture like you know books and music and film all have you know like they're related i mean i i think it's silly if you think like if you're gonna think that oh music and movies videos like in the bookstore that's like those those aren't at the same level of culture as my precious words like yeah, but you know, cheesy horrible popcorn books just as much as there's popcorn films and there's mm-hmm. there's music that uh is more advanced and to me it like they all they all work together well like i worked yeah. in the in the uh the barnes and noble cafe now serving starbucks coffee uh <laughs> for a bit and they always were playing at the time it was like that i think her name was like nora jones R. Jones. Yeah, they play that way with me. So much. Yeah. yeah. When I when I started, we could actually there was actually some leeway, and we got away with playing our like music that we wanted to play that wasn't 
but then um they really like cracked down on like no you can only like play these particular cds but we were playing like all kinds of weird bands my my friend jeremy who was he was the manager when i started and then i took over when he left but you know he would just like like here check this out and he just pulled the whole story has to check it out with me you know the whole store um yeah. has to listen to like whatever weird alternative band he had like obscure band that he had just discovered and we had like this one guy who's like you know he's gonna play seven hours of grateful dead on his shift and it's just like nah, you know yeah it's cool man oh yeah there you go <laughs> so, it was totally not like a a planned segue into well you know i'm, I'm like a grateful dead artist now jeffrey let, let's give let's give no uh a plug here <laughs> yeah. like tie it into real life hell yeah do you still have that Andrew Bird poster that somebody stole for you? Was that Paul Merchmeyer that stole it for you? I I don't know that I would say that's stealing. It, I mean, it certainly was stealing. You guys, he was just trying to advertise his show at the coffee shop. You robbed him of his <laughs> of his advertising. I'm, okay, first of all, I paid back that advertising in kind by yeah, writing writing about him, and I there's at least two people who said that they started listening to Andrew Bird. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the same two people that didn't see the poster. And now. So you don't work at coffee shops anymore. You work at home. Like, well, right now. Yeah, no, I. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, now, but normally <laughs> work at the coffee shop at all. No, there's still, I still have a local shop. It's beans and bagels is my, my local neighborhood uh, coffee shop. And no, what happened was, is just in terms of getting my day started, the like with kids and school and um i just kind of transitioned to like getting a better start to the day if i just work at home mm. then i also started i started playing um lunchtime pickup soccer um those games are at like noon so it didn't make sense to like try and go to the coffee shop then get ready for come back home get ready for soccer then go. so was doing that two or three three days a week and so those days I would just um, work at home until it was time to to head over to the game. So, but like, do they know who you are when you go in there to work? Are they like, it's Jeffrey Brown, does the Star Wars books? Not like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like I because I've been going there since long before. Like so, Adam, the guy who who runs the sh the shop, like you know, like he's he's known me on on the the way lower level so mm -hmm. so he just he just gives me a hard time about it you know it's like, like oh he'll he, like i'll walk in and be like hey everybody <laughs> yeah. Yeah. he's and like he trying just, to feed you like, jokes all the time like i thought of a really good joke about kylo ren yeah. i'm sorry about the bagels they're a little chewy this morning <laughs> yeah he lets me he lets me toil away in my my own obscurity um how many of the wait are you working on that star wars stuff now or is that like old news not to the extent that I was. I mean, there was, so there was basically like four years where I did seven Star Wars books yeah. over four years, which is insane. Way um, and I, but I like, we still, we've done a new Star Wars calendar every year. And so I usually do one or two new drawings at least for that. Sometimes like, and then some spot illustrations. And then I just did a uh, Ray and Pals was the new, the newest book that came out last fall. And um, so I've like, I've slowed down on, on how much, but you know, it's like, it's still, it's, it's a good work and it's drawing Star Wars, you know, it's easy and yeah. fun enough. And you like the new movies? When I'm watching movies, sometimes I'll see like, oh, they did, this is the reason why they have that scene. Like, this is what they're trying to do. Or I see, like, missed opportunities. It's like, this character, they could have had a scene back here that did accomplish the same goal as whatever scene they did have, but yeah. use this character. And, you know, just like, it, and so it, it can drive you crazy. But those those movies were never going to be satisfactory. Um, That's true. But, man, I got enraged. I did the same thing watching the latest one, especially. I was just like, what, 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 why, why do you, yeah. <laughs> like, all this stuff why, is so goofy. Like, well, how long did this book take you to do? That book? Yeah. 
Did you subscribe to Star Wars Insider Magazine as a kid? No. I would always cut out um, the little forums in the back of of things for like joining the Star Wars fan club, but I would never actually join. But, but we did mail away for the the toys for the Kenner toys the like the action figure like you mail in whatever proof of purchases and yeah. or you get like a little pack of accessories or something. Yeah, I did that so, too. I got, the, I got the ghost of Obi Wan Kenobi, like that. Yeah. And I got uh, was it Han Solo and Stormtrooper in Stormtrooper disguise? The other one was uh, the band, the Moss Eisley band you could get from Star Wars Insider magazine. Oh, I didn't get that. Yeah, but it was cool. Were you ever in Star Wars Insider? I did a cover for them once, and then did some interviews and i always like tried to get them to do like behind the scenes like unused sketches and stuff yeah are you working on a graphic novel or are you working on another uh like not star- a, i mean i am kind of working on a star wars thing but i can't talk about it yet mm-hmm. do you are you ha- do you have the constantly pitch books is that what that's that life is like you're just like constantly like here's what I'm, i want to do next um yes and no I mean, right now I'm not pitching. It's like kind of a combination of like people coming to me and then me having things that I want to do. And but it's not constantly pitching. Like right, well, this this part of that is the the science fiction I, series I signed on to do four books. Yeah. Um, so it's like I I don't have time to to do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a that's a lot. Um, I mean, I'm, I am doing other stuff, but like, as far as pitching, like the next project, it's, it's, you know, it wasn't until I was, I, I guess I was working in the third book of, of the Neanderthal series when I signed on to do the science fiction series. So, so I still have like a, a couple of years before I need to like worry about really pitching the next thing, but it's yeah. a, yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a grind to like, um, I don't know. It's not like the old days working with Top Shelf where I would just like, I need to just to do whatever, whatever nonsense I felt like doing. And then like when I, I finished it, when I finished it, and then I would just like tell Chris Darrow's like, hey, I've got this book. And then he was like, okay, I'll put it in the queue. But yeah. all, all that work must be out of print at this point because they turned into a different company. No, I mean, I think, no, I, it's all, I mean, I think it's still mostly all in print. I think, like, I am going to be small might be out of print at the moment, but mm-hmm. I think we're going to, we might try to do new editions of, like, the relationship books. Oh, um, okay. Next year will be, like, the 20th anniversary. Wow. Uh, Clumsy or, or what? Not next year, like, the two years yeah of clumsy which is insane wow yeah and i was thinking actually about rescanning them but even that seems like like a ton of work and like yeah that was the whole story with clumsy was that you and and paul hornchmeyer just like scanned that stuff in and put the book together and you self-published it yeah how many copies yep. did you publish of the first volume the first two thousand of to start so Damn. And then you uh, sold them to Quimby's. Yeah, I was selling them to Quimby's, and I would send the box to Last Gasp, and um, and then Top Shelf was helping distribute. So they would just like they just had like a couple hundred copies, and Chris would bring, you know, ten like to whatever comic convention Top Shelf was set up at, and sell them there. Um, and then Top Shelf, so they offer to solicit in Diamond. Mm-hmm. you know to get it in in the, like the rest of the comic shops and the pre-orders were for like 1200 copies and i had like 1100 copies or something left yeah and so that so then chris was like well you can either like do another printing and we'll use those copies to to so that we have enough for the order or top shelf will take over as publisher and the the difference was that you didn't get any of the money cuz top shelf published <laughs> it I'm I you know those books are still with Top Shelf. Um, I feel like Top Shelf w- worked out really well for me. I I never felt like I wasn't getting paid what was selling. Um, Top Shelf was 
like a you know like they were a big like like you said like i would do something and they would be like okay we'll we'll put it out like whatever stupid little thing like you know um top shelf did right by me so mm-hmm. um yeah man you were fucking prolific too in alternative comics man you were like in every anthology there was like always like a, a new book but like i i took that as like a model i mean that's the model that i still use like i'll just if anybody wants anything from me i, I just try to like i kind of like learned from how you were at that point in alternative comics you know yeah so, i mean i like like it was good for one for just you know honing your skills just being productive is is like just putting out a lot of work you get a lot better like when people are like oh you'll get a lot of exposure if you do this thing for me it, that can be a scam but i never felt like like I, the projects that i was part of what i got out of them and and what i put into them um always felt like a fair trade to me and i, th- yeah. I think it always worked out yeah out well yeah, how many how many nights have you ruined for Chris Ware? Um, I'm sure three. Three maybe. or four? Maybe yeah. four. Yeah, maybe four. How many nights have you ruined for Chris Ware? Uh, like a dozen, maybe. <laughs> or more. I don't know. But Chris Ware was a like a big champion of you very early on when you were like just starting out, yeah. right? Yeah, he was I mean he was like like he he was a huge help on a million, a million different ways. Like, um, like first just looking at my work and giving me some encouraging words, you know, he actually, um, he, he used to still go downtown, um, Chicago to, um, when he was still doing the weekly pages for the new city and he would still, like, you know, like, they would still be shot by photo, not scanned. Oh, wow. And so he, he would bring the pages downtown. And he actually stopped by my studio at the Art Institute to, like, look at my work and talk to me. And yeah. um, and then he was the one who actually put connected me with Paul Hornschmeyer. So, I mean, from the first time I met him, like, he was always just hugely supportive and encouraging. And yeah. Well, um, did he know Paul yeah. from uh, when he was self-publishing the Ragtime Ephemeralist or something? Was Paul? Yeah, because Paul worked for, for West West Can, the print. Oh, I see. This is off topic, but do you know this comic? Yeah, I remember that. What was your era of superhero comics, like the Wolverine comics you were into and stuff, the 80s? Yeah, like early 80s. So X-Men... You know, starting like the Chris Claremont, John Romita Jr. years was probably like the the key the key time. Like so, issue one one seventy through two twenty was like yeah. those fifty issues. You still have them? Yeah, I've actually still I still <laughs> have them. I've actually got on my wall. Oh wow! Here, that's a. Here. Oh, actually, wait. Why am I doing it that? Like, I, I've, I've got this handy system. Let me just pull it down. Yeah. So this is an original page from issue 193. So yeah. I've got the. Printed. Oh, <laughs> cool. Um. So issue 192 was the first comic book I bought with my own money. Um. And but I haven't been able to find a page of original art from that issue. But this is 193. And I love it because, like, if you look, like, they had, he had to redraw Professor Xavier here. And so, oh, like, yeah. there's, like, the little, I don't, you probably can't see it, but there's, like, a little line where, like, he, like it's cut out and oh, taped in. Like, you can see yeah. on the back. like, But then in the comic, you can actually see, like, the slight line of, of oh, where yeah. it's cut and stuff. But, yeah, it's, uh, so that's that's hanging in my wall. That's awesome. Well. Did you, X-Men. did you read this series taboo yeah in fact i because mostly because of mobius so that issue but yeah, yeah. i used to get, get those. it's good that stuff. cover that's amazing right it's so good yeah there's some really good weird stuff in taboo 
Yeah, yeah. I think uh, From Hell was being serialized in Taboo for the first time. Yeah. Now, what do you think about... Do you think you'll read the um, the recolored versions or the original black and white? Man, I got some of the recolored ones. Uh, I think, honestly, I just don't like his sense of color. It, it bothered me. If somebody else had colored it, I would I would be into it, but I like his drawings. I just don't like his, yeah. his color sense. It doesn't work I, for me. Uh, I think for From Hell, I I I pref- I much prefer the black and white. But I will say, like, um, you know, he Eddie did the the book, the couple books that where he started to do collage and weird color stuff mm-hmm. mixed in. And it like the idea of it, I was like, I'm just not gonna like that. I love the I love the art in From Hell, and I love the Alex stuff, and mm-hmm. and like I don't know, but reading those books, like I really started to like like all that weird stuff but i don't i think the, those work um because they're done that way from the start and i don't like like going back and retrofitting from hell doesn't seem as fitting to me but yeah i, I agree i but you know it's it's funny you bring that up because i i think that's true like when i first saw uh the wonderful horrible stuff the one you did about money yeah um, I was like, ah, Jesus. But I read it and I actually liked it. And then one that I really yeah. liked where he used that same technique was The Fate of the Artist, I think is what it was called. Yep. Where he's yep. just like super fucking depressed and it seems like a suicide note the entire book. But I really liked that a lot. He had his daughter in there. Yeah. Like he just put like superimposed his daughter in the panels. Yeah. I thought, yeah. Was, I thought that was good. He also did the, the the book the playwright that he didn't write but he did the artwork for it and that yeah. and that one isn't it doesn't have all the collage elements and the photo elements but it, um it's water colored and mm-hmm. um i thought the coloring in that was great too yeah that was great I, I remember in 2000 uh i think it was 2012 i was in portland and brett warnock was like you can stay at my house while you're here and i was like okay so i stayed at his house and he brought me to the basement and he had like all these books i think top shelf was maybe I don't know. It seems like they were talking about going under or something. Cause he was just like, take any books you want. I don't care. He was like selling off all his uh, issues of raw and all this stuff. And I was just like, man, what's going on? It's like, he was quitting comics. I'm sure publishing comics w- will suck the love of comics. Out of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. Yesterday I did a conversation with Eric Reynolds and I'm just like, how is it possible that this guy is still so positive and reads comics on his free time? Like, I feel like he's so under uh, underrated as like um like i think everyone just sees gary groth and like thinks about gary groth and yeah like um they don't realize that the true secret sauce is eric reynolds right? you know, I have trouble answering emails and i get like maybe two three emails a day <laughs> that aren't uh-huh. spam and i have i have trouble answering those so i don't know what it would be like to just constantly like look at your inbox and it's you know, Tony Millionaire, who wants something from you again. I, I don't know. <laughs> Can I tell you my Star Wars uh, book that I'm going to do? Yeah. I want to do a Star Wars book about Salacious Crumb. That's just basically the king of comedy, but with Salacious Crumb. And it's about him getting a job in Jabba's Palace. So the, the origin story. Yeah, the origin story. How he got that gig. And then, like, you know, yeah. when he finally wins Jabba's trust. That's the day that Luke Skywalker arrives, and then so anyway, so you just get your people to talk to my people. We'll we'll work out a a kids book that's based on the King of Comedy. <laughs> okay, so like when something like Baby Yoda hits, and it's like the biggest thing culturally, do you get pressure to then do Baby Yoda stuff in your comics? Lots of people have asked about like, are are you going to do a Mandalorian or Baby Yoda book? Um, yeah. but uh. So, yeah, I mean, there's, to some extent, I mean, it's not so much direct pressure. I, maybe that maybe that will come with season two. I don't know. But, yeah, <laughs> there's always, like, a little bit of a, I'd like to see you draw Baby Yoda. I actually, I think I've only, I think I drew Baby Yoda, like, as a, as a sketch at a convention so far. But I haven't really gotten too far into it. I, I really enjoy, I enjoyed The Mandalorian. Do you still have stories in you? Like you used to, like you still have things you want to say that you want to write about. I mean, one one thing that I've I've had that I've like wanted to do for a long time is just a book about about 
process and making art and making a living in comics, stories from conventions and and different things. I want to do something with that, but such a it's still in a place where it's like I don't know exactly what it what I want it to be. Since I like a matter of life was the last book where I knew what I like I had a vision like I wanted to write about fatherhood and religion and um and I knew the stories that I kind of wanted to put in and kind of how I wanted it, the book to feel. But I since then, like there's stories that I kind of want to tell or things that I might want to talk about, but not in a way that like I know what it is. So I don't want to, I'm not going to force myself to do something just because I think I should do it. Um, yeah. So for now, I'm just do some Star Wars stuff here and there and um, like, like, um, when it when it's time then i think i'll i'll be ready but like so i've got like i've got my little sketchbook that's that has like different different ideas and things mm -hmm. um different notes about potential projects and it's just like this just kind of sits and stews and then years can go by it's just been churning in the back of my head and something will click and i'll be like there there we oh. go like there have been times when i've had ideas and i've like sat down like you know what i think i should write about this and i'll sit down to write about it and i'll start it and then it's just like no it doesn't feel right now i hate it like yeah it. um so like this the sketchbook the like the ideas like come and go and like sometimes they'll like an idea will be on there for a few years and then i'll be like you know what I've been thinking about that in the back of my mind for a few years because every time I see like I see the list like and I think about the list and the, it just reaches a point where it's like you know what like I really don't love that idea I really don't know what it would be and I don't really care about it and and then it's like the ideas like that make it through that gauntlet of sitting on the shelf and like it's like no it's my turn they can come and get get realized <laughs> okay, here's well, here's something that Craig Thompson said that was new to me about working in YA graphic novels is that he put out Space Dumplings and the, it didn't sell gangbusters, and he found out that you're supposed to do a series to get to get like a return. Like he would have to do like a few other Space Space Dumplings for people to really go back and buy the first one. The kids' book market is way different, um, and there like definitely kids want a series and and you also have to churn them out super fast yeah. like i've been doing like a book a year mm -hmm. and it's 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 tough um to keep up that schedule but the thing is like kids like they're only so old for so long you know it's like they grow up and so yeah. and they and they also just devour stuff so like like i mean dave pilkey could do five dogman books a year and in, in my like my son Simon would consume more than that, you know. So um, you, you only work at one book at a time now, right? You don't have several plates spinning. No, I no, I have lots of I like those are just the ones I told you about. <laughs> <laughs> just, like I'm doing a follow up to Kids Are Weird, like oh. just things that Simon said because Kids Are Weird is with Oscar and you know so like otherwise like it seemed like I. I like one kid better than the other if I don't do a book for both of them. But I've been I've been working on this for like like three or four years, like just on this like as a side thing, just slowly like penciled like over a year, just in between things or like to take a break from other stuff. And then I like did all the line work, and I'm doing the coloring, and I just like will color a page here and there. Do you have a schedule uh, yeah. of, like, do you, like, work nine to five every day? I mean, yes, mostly. I usually stay up later than everyone else and, like, work for a couple more hours after, like, the kids are asleep. And to go along with the thought about, you know, ideas sitting in the back of your mind, like, if there's a, something I'm working on on the writing side, um, think about story as, like, I'm falling asleep or whatever. Hmm. my bedroom's like on the other side of the studio room so like i can just run in here if i get inspired which i like i'll just get out of bed try i'll have like a um a bunch of problem solving that i need to do with like a story right. and i'll just read it 
read through everything, and then when I'm in bed at night, all of a sudden something will hit me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I get out of bed, yeah. just run into here, and like sit down with a notebook yeah. and try and write stuff out to remember the next morning. Well, I so I like to have I like to have things pretty planned out, but I always like to leave wiggle room at every mm-hmm. stage. So I teach I teach comics at the School of the Art Institute, and oh, know that. Um, just the spring semester I teach you know a class, and there's um, 15 to 18 students, and I can tell you like their comics literacy in terms of making comics is so way so much more advanced than than mine was when wow. I was in college mm-hmm. and then you look at like what is available for kids um, or for younger readers with middle grade books and like Raina Telgemeier and Jean Yang and um, even like the Dave Pilkey Dogman stuff like so I think I think they're I think the idea that it was going to progress from like here's David Boring and Jimmy Corrigan and then, yep. like, it's only going to go up from there. I think the ascent isn't just a straight, straight up curve. You know, it's it's yeah. there's going to be dips. And I think the the important thing is is that those those books in that time kind of set up. But the payoff is is just going to come way later. I think in the long term, what you're going to get from comics is is still going to be great down the road um the best is yet to come in a way yeah i think you're right um, fanographics does this anthology called now where they just mm-hmm. publish like mostly like the newest stuff and there's amazing work in there especially the latest yeah. issue that has like a al columbia cover of a frog so, um, it, uh, that gave me so much hope for the future of comics it's like incredible <laughs> what you mostly do like mainstream comic shows though don't you yeah, it's kind of switched to like doing almost book festivals and yeah. things. Um, Those are great. A, yeah, it's a very different market, and um, like I still San Diego Comic Con, I still mostly do every year. I was gonna do Heroes Con this year. So. Yeah, I was gonna do Heroes Con too, cause I I live in South Carolina now, so I was just like, oh, I can yeah. just go. It'd be great, and that's a great show. I really like that one. Yeah, I've. It's been, it's been a long time since I've done it, and the times I've done it, like I loved it. Um, mm-hmm. So I was really I was looking forward to that. But um, do you have any awkward meeting your heroes stories? I mean, yeah, I've got lots of <laughs> lots of those <laughs> stories. So so Louis Trondheim was at um, was it at San Diego? Like mm-hmm. a was it was that last year or the two years ago? And I was like. I introduced myself and he's like, yeah, we've met before uh. <laughs> that I, yeah, I felt like a moron when you're, when you're at comic conventions and you're meeting so many people. Um, but you don't have like meetings of, you know, where you're just like uh, in the middle of the night you wake up and you're like, oh, I can't believe I said that to David Collier or something. <laughs> I have nothing but in fact, after this conversation's over, I'm going to be like, oh, God damn it. Why did I say that? Uh, one time I was, when I first met Kevin Heisinger, I was out, uh, at dinner and he was sitting next to me. It was like a cartoonist dinner and I was talking to him and then, uh, eventually he stopped me. He's like, you're kind of pushy, aren't you? And I, <laughs> and I just felt really embarrassed because I don't think of myself as pushy, but I, I know that like, I get really excited when I'm talking to people sometimes oh. and I, and if somebody doesn't want to speak about something, I don't really pick up on that cue. I just keep pushing it like, yeah. ah, come on, ah, you know. That's a very that's a very Kevin Heisinger kind of interaction. I, f- I feel like everyone probably has at least one Kevin Heisinger interaction like that. And I've had people come to me too and be like, oh, was that like I'm so sorry about this awkward thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, and like it was like in their head it was like this this horrible moment and like I it, don't even remember it. So I yeah. Did you remember all the after convention? parties where you're just like in the bar at spx to everybody yeah and you're just like super drunk and then you have to wake up the next day and do it all over again i mean <laughs> to go sit behind the top shelf table and that awful yellow room with the terrible paintings and the awful carpet well i didn't really notice those i was really looking at my like huge line of fans but oh, that's true yeah um, <laughs> no, no i 
I don't know. I never, I never, I don't think I ever really got super hung over at a convention. Like I always, I think maybe there's maybe once or twice like at San Diego or something where it's like, but it wasn't so much the, the drinking as like, you know, after being at the show all day, then going out and being in crowds of people for another 10 hours. And then it's, you know, five hours of sleep and you're like, Oh, that was a mistake. Yeah. Have you have you met Neil Gaiman before? Yeah. Was he really nice to you? Mm, I mean, he was nice enough. He wasn't a jerk, necessarily. Yeah. I don't know. Did he know who you were? Not really. Have you met... Uh, you, have you met? <laughs> these are people that you had bad experiences? It's just a, like a lot of the the right things coming together at the right moments and so i i would say like just focus on what you're doing to make the best book that you can make so yeah all right man i'm gonna let you go because it's been i've taken a lot of your time actually yeah well it's good talking to you yeah it was good talking to you too i really appreciate it